we were talking about how one can work with such dramatic effects in the 21st century. I would like to take a look at this issue from three angles. We were talking about social media, that indeed there is digital in the web version, on the web. One can tell a lot on the internet, there's a lot of information online, but there is a lot of erroneous information online, at least, uh, well, moreover, it is the majority of er erroneous information. A museum is the right place to go to, to find relevant information. It's now much more difficult to do that. We are not even sure about this in with the regular media. But I think the museums can play uh, the role of an objective truth giver. Physically, when, regarding the physical presence, I read that Ukraine applied to make the Chernobyl exclusion area the UNESCO cultural heritage. And I think this is a super idea. There's a lot of debate whether it is heritage or not, because they are talking in UNESCO more about achievements, and that's a failure. But I believe such places with this kind of heavy history and heavy traumatic burden, they are very great to come over physically to. You know that in Poland, the concentration camps are the top visited places ever. Uh, there are a lot of people who are interested in the end of the world, it's a global trend, and they're interested in catastrophes, etc. Something dark to, 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 couldn't hear about that. That might be very interesting. Mm. So are they people, uh, I mean, people are getting more interested, I mean, more and more interested in the end of the world issue. And they've always been like the apocalypse, apocalypse and everything. Regarding the new technology, there is difference in all those digital things. The web is one thing this regarding information and the immersive part is something different. How to actually share this information with a new generation? This is the third part of it. For instance, immersive projects they can be really interesting because you are not physically on the plate in the place. Maybe you could, will not feel the energy of the place, but there is the effect of presence. It's much greater than with certain when you see certain artifacts. Such immersive visits, they can be really, really interesting because they help people dive into the area and feel it really. In Toulouse, and there was a 20 years um, back, a big chemical factory trouble. Uh, this recently was celebrated to 20, 20 or 25 years, and they released a movie about the tragedy, what happened in its chemical factory. And through this immersive technology, people can dive into those days and places, and they feel the affinity to this. That's why we are building the memorials. Our whole country is full of uh, those uh, those unknown soldier memorials. I'm from Odessa, and we had the a lot of monuments to the unknown sailor. And I can still hear the, these words, remember, remember. So this is a difficult memory, isn't it? I think as you dive into it, this experience that you survive it it is going to be much more efficient than if you read anything about any of the cases or events thank you so much milena are you with us maybe you got better connected
I, I think our technicians are trying to fix that. Milena, I'm sorry. Can you say something? Is it any better now? No, it's not. I'm going to share my comments about what Natalia just said regarding new technology and immersive technology. Indeed, one of the ideas you know, of building monuments and museums is to engage people to those topics, to those issues, to come over it and see the monuments, to take a look at those artifacts. The museum is a more immersive story, but this is related to archiving and musification. And there is nothing better than real artifact. But with the new technology, they are not trying to replace those artifacts. This is just a new communication channel which can broaden either the perception of the art artifact and provide broader access to it. So people from all over the world can see those artifacts from their places. Regarding the new immersive technology, yes, if we want people to come to those memorials in the museums or to, to come to see the artifacts, we need to develop those immersive technologies because they can enlarge our audience and provide access to the people from all over the world to some very interesting uh, artifacts experience and uh, uh, stories to be shared. Digital technologies are very inclusive. They're inclusive in all the parameters. If uh, a person cannot move or cannot physically come over to the place, or for instance, if, and at the same time, this person is interested in a certain country, but live, lives in a different country. Cases can be many, but digital technologies are really um, accessible and inclusive. Digital technologies incorporate audio and visual components. There can be text messages, audio visuals, they can be just audios, they can be available in different languages. For instance, it's, um, people, some people cannot uh, perceive visual information with uh, the sight imparity, impairment, I'm sorry. Um, they can just listen to some of the stories, this allows broadening the audience and reach out to all the categories in their diversity. Now let's talk about some of the traumatizing events. So what do you think? Those tra traumatic experiences and cases, what Natalia just sp spoke about, those stories are not positive and it's difficult to engage people to things that can cause pain and trauma and bad emotion, but we all as experts realize that we cannot handle it without this, because we are as the insiders, we all understand this, but very often I'm facing a situation that people do not want to go to the Chernobyl or Holodomor Museum. They're saying, this is something negative. I do not want to spend my Saturday and walk there with my kids to dive into the negative emotion and then explain to, to my family how it all happened and why maybe my kids will be traumatized because of this. They will be sleeping badly because they are all scared and uh, they will remember for their entire life how their dad once took them to the Chernobyl Museum, for instance. But what do you think about this? This is quite a broad issue. There is certain specificity about those cultural heritage facts and those museums as well. How to, do we engage the audience and how to work with the negative emotion in the right way? 
how to evade from those negative emotions, how to explain to the people they need that. It's not just that they need it, but they need to understand why it happened and what were, had been, or the root causes had been. Some people do not want to think heavily. Indeed, there are people who are just stopped at the stairs. They just stop at the stairs and say, we're not get getting in. At the same time, some people find it very attractive. And that has to do with Holodomor as well. Very often, children and especially teenagers come over, they listen to the tour guide and then say, OK, show us those horrible photos. So they want to see the photos. This is part of their own experience. I think that because this is Chernobyl, there is a Holodomor story, because there is a component that is behind their boundary, they are find hard to overcome and they want to deny it. The only thing we can do, um, they, they're trying to do is just to stay away from it, trying to create uh, artificial boundaries and we need to explain this is no game, this is no entertainment. If a person is tired and the person's life is difficult, the person might be in a depression, it's probably not worth going to the museum. It's not worth consuming such information. But we cannot simplify this information. We can not only show good things and we can say, give a warning saying, because um, we have certain age categories. We are not, for instance, telling little kids about some of the things and we're sharing more information with the um, with the adolescents. If there are even uh, adult people, we uh, warn them beforehand if they are ready to see those horrible pictures. I think such museums and projects that work with these cases and events, they have to try to be as much objective as possible. And at the same time, they have to be institutions that are talking about us, uh, to us about morality, about the good and the evil. Those are not just simple things. They cannot be converted into an entertainment format. Even a TikTok format for our museum would not be even admissible because um, TikTok is more about entertainment and this is not about our story. So it's very important to choose the right communication channels that can help you talk to the audience and choose the content as how we as to how we deliver it from a more scientific standpoint, but it shouldn't be boring. If we're saying scientific, it means we have to be talking about facts. I will give our, give our own based on the culture studies and other things, because people sometimes go not only to entertain themselves, but they sometimes have need for finding more information about some facts. And our projects in our museums, they have to satisfy this part of the people's demand regarding new information and also to for them to acquire new information and knowledge. This is a very strong factor. It's no less important than longing for pleasure, fun and entertainment. Thank you so much. Anna, can you share some comments of yours, please? I think you have something, something to say here. Yes, I'm going to share some of my experience and the experience of our, of our museum, because this is really special, like you mentioned. How do you actually delineate the strategy, uh, I mean, Holodomor, with the tragedy our museum is talking about? As we deliver the information to the people, and primarily as we work with the kids and teenagers and students, we normally focus our work on life safety. And people who come over to the museum, there is a category of people who belong to the dark tourism. They want to see something horrific in the museum. They're trying to avoid showing them those nasty pictures of people. We have some 
of the brush strokes of that nature, but there are not a lot of them, and we are not trying to show that to the kids. All this work is streamlined and focused on life safety. People are interested in what's going to be next, how radiation can affect their life in the future, how their children, children's life and grandchildren's lives will be affected, not only in Ukraine, but also in other areas, because nuclear power exists virtually in each and every country, and this topic is very interesting. So we show that through our exposition and through and the different projects that we are run, running. We have the meetings, we have different uh, other activities that we perform. There is a different issue as well. Those are the first responded, the responders, who are real heroes. In Ukraine, there are 190,000 people remaining, and there used to be 340,000. This is a separate issue. Um, so we have to make sure those people feel they're, they're needed for this country. We, their experience is interesting. And the society is not trying to actually uh, get away from them. This is a separate category. They come over to the museum with their children and great children and great great children so uh, in order to support them we're trying to implement all this very successfully because children who come over to the place and they can see the pictures of the first responders and learn about their stories in every bunch of children there is always one person who asks okay why don't you have stories about my grandfather and we we realize that we are in the right track this is exactly what our goal is focused on we want to make sure our children remember their history the histories of their families they need to pay much more attention to their parents and grandparents they will come collect their stories. They will want to see the artifacts. They bring the artifacts to the museum and want us to share the story about their parents and grandparents. This is a very important area for our work. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Natalia? You know, I just recalled one great case. This is a Jewish museum in Berlin. It, it's an emotionally negative place, but this is one of the best museum in the world anyways. People come to get emotion. The emotions can be positive or negative, but as you uh, as you're filled with it, with a lot of emotions, then you get enough experience and it ticks and clicks in your hand. And it, it actually stays, the wow, the wow effect stays with you for a very long time. It can be triggered by both positive and negative things. You need to see the audience. Do I know if Jewish people go to that museum? That's the same thing about the first responders. Those are the people who were negatively affected by this and they need to be take, taken care of. But if, for instance, their grandchildren come over, or the first responders, or those Jewish people in Berlin, maybe this is a family trauma. That is it's not something they're personal, their personal nature. They demonstrate their own interest. And there is general public who can be uh, of uh, any, any, who can have many reasons to come over in thought for certain feelings something like that all right thank you let us move to the next question it also comes from your answers in a nutshell the target audience 
in all the culture projects and also those that are related to the national trauma, there are two major audiences that are considered. Those people who were directly affected, the victims, I mean, and also the broader public who were never affected by this mm, directly. Those are, for instance, grandchildren of uh, the victims or first responders, but they have those memories in their families. But we're all connected to everything that uh, happened in our country eventually. But very often they forget about such audience as the people who were directly participating in those events, who were um, who were the um, the guilty ones. Uh, they call them those executioners or butchers or hangmen, because even in um, with the concentration camps, they started to actually uh, look for those killers and learn their stories. I mean, so I would like to actually ask you, how do you work with those three audiences? First one is those who were directly affected or victimized. Secondly, this is the broad republic. And third, these are those who executed those things. Those are like um, slaughtermen, the to torturers, hangers. It's difficult to say because those who were victims of Holodomor, those who suffered, there are very few people. They're mostly over 90 years old. So for, for us, for the country, they're interesting because they are direct um, uh, witnesses of those um, facts. 50% of the information we have are the memories of those people. So that piece of information is really important. Before COVID, we had been organizing meetings with the witnesses when it was, when it had been possible, it was possible. So they came, came over to the museum and this, these contacts with the person when other people come, students and other visitors, those was those events were difficult to organize because not each and every person would agree to talk about this. You never know how the conversation will go. People feel deadly sometimes because those those people are quite elderly. They start crying, and that's always very emotional. At the same time, generally any trauma has mainly two phases in it. This is direct. Uh, traumatization when you feel through it. Before 90s, we had been still recovering from the Holodomor. After 90s, we had the next phase when we started to build concepts, the vision, when there was an opportunity not just to whip, but also try to realize what had happened. So I think the people who were witnesses of Holodomor, they cannot yet conceptualize the, those facts only in certain except with certain exceptions when they're trying to self-reflect and try to draw the pictures or write poetry they trying to actually look from uh, take a side look at what had happened so we can only now exist in phase two because this happened and we need to do something about it we need we need to share the story and the lessons learned there is also important. It is also important to mention about the people who are and who are descendants of the victims. They know their grandchildren, sorry, grandparents, their grandpas and grandmas used to be like kolkhoz managers or partisan people. Those are stories are very difficult because those descendants do not want to actually um, those memories about their families be reflected on their present they as they bring artifacts they either want to stay anonymous sometimes those people are just trapped or were just trapped by the system so we can we should not say that hey this was your grandfather who killed so many people they are afraid of such accusations we have a research center and we through that research center do not allow anyone to judge the other people so i think there's uh, 
there should be an objective balance and it should be really important in working with that audience. But our key audience is primarily the descendants of the people who are uh, Holodomor survivors and we are working with them closely. It's actually quite easy to work with them because whatever you tell them, normally they, they say, yes, I remember my grandma telling me about this. So this is all alive and that's a very interesting um, framework to work with. It's not as easy to work with this, but it's, um, it's just about the fact that people are much more responsive. They're trying to respond to our needs. Most importantly, it is to be able to talk to the people. Try to talk to them. Do not blame them. This is the only thing we can do to them. So I have a question to you. What about Chernobyl? How many more years do we have to cry about it? Well, it all depends on how many people are still alive who used to live in Pripyat next to Chernobyl power plant. And how many of those people are were the firefighters and first responders involved in the relief exercise and how many people there are still in the percentage to the overall population i think those who have not been directly involved in that they um, can conceptualize things but those first responders still living i think they may find it really difficult and quite emotional to talk about this they should not be heavily criticized there is a lot of criticism. Yes, we do have a lot as well when we're trying to do a, a something special. They shoot movies, they write books. So this conceptualizing rate of the artwork, through the artworks or moral rethinking. Anna, I think you have something to share here and probably a lot. Well, first of all, I, I want to tell you that our museum's slogan that welcomes people at the front door as they go get into the our exposition through the so-called exclusion zone, conditionally saying there are words like this in Latin. There is a boundary in the grief while anxiety Boundaries has not. This is an answer to the question whether how whether we have to cry and how long do we have to cry. It's not our objective to cry, but we have to teach people how to take care, how to be anxious about this. Anxiety, this is what pushes people not to make mistakes, especially this is about responsible people who have to make important decisions. We sometimes have specific visitors to our museum, those people who are state actors. I mean, government officials from many different countries. And this is quite a substantial category of our visitors to the museum. So for them, these words are really relevant because they need to prevent things and make important decisions in their lives. That's why the exposition of the museum is built the way that people could feel emotions, both tragical and compassion and maybe even fear. But at the emotional level, through those impressed philosophical and creative images we try to set up people emotionally to perceive this documentary and historic information once the person is ready after going through this path and entering the first room these people are already tuned to perceiving and grasping the information and that's true not only for the visitors but also for the people who are handing over the artifacts and documentation to us. Those are the first responders primarily. With them, it is quite 
I mean, the, the situation of co collaboration with them is is changing over time. I can still remember how we worked with them at the first stage and how we do that now. The uh, whole environment is very vibrant and it's very diverse and it's not, there is no comfort in itself. And there is a lot of misunderstanding and that creates a lot of misunderstanding in the whole country. Even among them, there is no, no common understanding. They are fighting each other because of pensions, because of other benefits, and their stories are different. Their stories about their contribution is different. Everybody, each of the, I mean, the respondents are trying, responders are trying to say that it was their profession that helped rescue people because without them, everybody would actually die and they were the most important people on the ground. And the others are telling, telling the same thing about their occupation in the past. Well, of course, many people are gone already. I mean, they passed away, but they were not just the first responders for us. They, uh, for us, are the family. For them, our museum should be like their home. They can come over at any time, even beyond the working hours of the museum. The museum they can come over. They're always welcome. They need to understand this. They will be listened to and they will be paid attention to because sometimes they're rejected by government offices and different agencies. They're saying, all that happened in the Soviet Union. And we were, we did not send you there. This is your problem. For us, this is just a burden. And uh, they're also rejecting some of the issues that the, our museum is trying to, is, is, is facing sometimes. But it is our museum's objective to actually provide amicable solutions to reconcile everyone for them to understand each other and find common ground and common sense. There is a memorial book of the res first responders. We did, our, uh, our total area is very insignificant. It's like 1,000 square meters, but there are so many people and so many stories. And I um, created this electronic memory book. Also digital helped us do that because we cannot print all those history books. We know that in Ukraine, there is a memory book from World War II. We do not have a, neither financially nor technically the possibility to print, have those books printed. But we have other technologies like to create an electronic an e-memory book. And we created it in 1996, and in 1997, it was already available to all the visitors. And already in 2009, we exposed it uh, online to a, an individual website page of ours, and then we could feel as the popularity of it uh, were, was growing immensely because uh, people, even from people in from other countries, came to see it even though it was only available in Ukrainian. Those who have responders in their family and they now live all around the world. They live in Germany and Israel and in the United States. So they found this book in the museum on our page and they were uh, coming to us from all around the globe that they want to be next to their their peers next to their brothers with whom they had been working together, relieving uh, the catastrophe. I'm saying this is the national memory book. We cannot be responsible for other people because um, we only maintain it in the Ukrainian language. This It doesn't matter. We don't have that in our country, neither they have it in Russia and the Russians are coming to, to them and people from Belarus. We had started it as our national book because mainly people from Ukraine were participating in the relief exercise, but also there were people from other, other USSR republics. 
So we actually try to take everybody to that book. And you see, this is giving those people uh, the hope and this extends their life. Because they can see they are needed for other people. And others listen. And they have a place where they come to with their children. And this is also one relevant issue for us that in our memorial book, uh, our memor memory book, uh, memorial book is available online as well. So there are a lot of uh, now schools that run online classes and distant learning opportunities, and they have the uh, first responder day on the 14th of December. And also there is uh, the, the uh, April the 26th, which is the commemoration day of the Chernobyl disaster. And they even come over online and see the pictures of people who might have already been died, but they st are still remembered by their compatriots, by their family and friends. And I'm sure this is going to be continued and this will stay to be relevant. This database has now become interactive for the rest of the world. That's actually how we handle it. They're no longer crying already. They're trying to actually analyze what they did they're trying to analyze things consciously and they're trying to actually share this with the rest of the world before covid we were organizing those meetings with tourists from different countries they were actually requesting such meetings you know what questions they asked you know what's the top most popular question how did you manage to survive after so many years after 25 30 35 years how did you fight your diseases? Did, did you have any illnesses after it, as aftermath of this catastrophe? Those were the lasting effects uh, when some of the people never saw the first responders. They kept asking, how did it happen? How did you survive? So this is something that our museum can bring to those people. And this is something that can make those people's lives longer. Thank you, Anna. Thanks a lot. It's just uh, a lot of time that we've already spent for this answer. But thank you very much. Milena, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, great. We should ask you three to five questions, and we're going to listen to you for another 30 minutes. You'll be catching up. I could hear everybody. I just couldn't say anything. All right, so what kind of question do we have to start with? Let us start with the question that we're discussing right now. Then we're going to talk about the different ta target audiences. We're going to be talking about the victimization, those people who were victimized, also the executors. You're just entering this discussion in the very middle of it. First of all, I understand that you, you could not hear me. I want to thank you for the invitation. And I'm happy to see our colleagues here. Being, wor being uh, working at the museum for more than 10 years, I would like to give you my uh, answers to all the previous questions and reflect on all the previous interventions and actually combine it with the last question you asked. Regarding what you were talking about, uh, this is all connected together. Those innovative technologies is just the means. I understand that there is a big resistance, let us be honest, uh, among the museum um, workers, especially in the regions regarding all those innovative solutions and technology. I think at this stage, the museum people keep understanding that it is the, the museum functions uh, com are, are standing on three pillars. First of all, this is research, then maintenance, maintenance and then sharing, I mean, dissemination. And some of the times those functions 
uh, get prioritized, prioritized, but they have to be balanced. I believe that only by researching and uh, preserving and maintaining museums will be pushing their audiences away. They will not be offering new information. They will have no visitors. Then what's the sense behind their operation? It's, there's no sense if there are no visitors at all. Regarding what you talk, talked about the apps and about the digital digital stocks and inventories, I think it is important to stress that the museum people, uh, they are very siloed. They do not have their own technical capabilities for quality digital solutions, but they do not want to encourage the people from somewhere else. This is their mindset. They're not always even ready to share something with their peer colleagues from other, other museums. Let us call it a spade a spade. They are siloed. That's a museum isolation. This is the feudalism and an old fashioned way of doing things, which stands creates barriers for incorporating new technologies. With regards to the audience perception, I'm definitely surprised that many from the museum people say we have designed a typical course, I mean, a typical tour, and we are sticking to it. But we're excluding the human factor. We keep forgetting that we are visited by so many different audiences, an experienced, highly professional tour guide. And you can actually um, touch upon the human resource issue, but that's a different thing. A professional will always be adapted and get adapted on the go, depending on the target audience he or she serves. Uh, and from the first minutes, this person can monitor and analyze who has come over, even if there is no information about the customer. Um, he or she can see the different reactions and response to certain topics. Of course, when we were talking about experienced uh, tour guides and empathy as well, that's important. If you're working for the people, if you're human centric, then you'll be able to feel the people. If you a priori wanted to show off and tell how great you are, that you know so many things, then it's not going to work. Regarding audience perception, it's not only about the museums and it's not only about the human resources in them, but it's this is about our society's readiness. And this readiness is brought up starting from education, from school years in the primary school, starting from artwork and, uh, and the creative education. It all depends on how we deliver this information. We clearly know that any horrifying story or horrible picture can be delivered the way the person understands. The person is not scared from the very outset, but could uh, really perceive the message that we're trying to convey. Just as an example, just recently in Italy, they opened MEIS Museum. This is the National Judaism and Holocaust Museum. Just a very small museum. Thank you very much, Anna, that you said that despite small space, the small area you have, you are still able to engage your audience. And we want to make this place, we want to make our museum the place for people to communicate. In the Italy's case, I was talking to their, their, their manager. She was coming to us um, back in 2019, and she told that their objective had been to actually take and prepare the visitors to perceiving and understanding the information. So they decided to present those stories, not as horror movies, you know, really. That was re really making facts that were presented in the manner that never triggered any kind of denial and refusal, nor resistance. If you want, you can Google and find this information. They already have interactive tours over there. So actually, this is it. Yeah. And one more thing I wanted to f finish by saying that, yes, I really loved how Anna, when Anna mentioned that we are like mediators between the society and uh, the community and uh, the the museum artifacts um, themselves. The museum needs to be a mediator between the artifacts, the story and the people. 
you cannot be a judge museum cannot be uh, uh the one who blames people or, or or facts thank you very much for very concise and very very um good answers to all the questions natalia if you're with us i would like you to answer we're be behind our our timeline we need to move to the next topic but my question was about the the uh, different audience sees those victimized their descendants and those butchers or hangmen Milena just mentioned that even negative information can be presented in the form in the, the way that the uh, children can understand this is the basis for our fairy tales if you listen to some of them you get frustrated i was reading about the uh, american indians who have been surviving a lot of genocide for 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 decades and not for decades but for hundreds of years for centuries and this has become part of their life now regarding when we move to conceptualizing their chernobyl facts i think when all those people die who are survivors and responders that's what what's happening with world war ii as this popular popul as this generation is gone and after world war ii there, there's more than 75 years passed there are five stages to recover from the trauma you first of all deny it it never happened then you have aggression then you have depression and only at the end you have perception and buy in you accept it so acceptance comes last once you have rethought about the things and facts that happened. And as for those butchers, I mean, the, the, those guilty ones, it's very important to actually understand this. When we have the Nazi, the Museum of Nazism, because all the Germans um, feel very sorry they have this shame and embarrassment about the nazis they have this current condition and you know this kind of shame is something that the people are not really ready to, sh to share with the others so it's important to actually study all those categories and uh, Finally, we need to study the two first and then to bring to the third one enough relevant information for this to have come, uh, some sense behind it to have this experience transferred and not to, to let these things happen again in the future. Well, this, this well, because Soviet Union has disintegrated and there's nobody responsible for it anymore. I mean, Chernobyl. There's no someone who we can direct all the negative emotion towards. So there is no attempt to find the guilty one, but, but they, they, they just want to perceive an objective um, situation. But the question regarding who's guilty and who are those people who are never uh, blamed uh, or tried for it it was the entire system but who exactly was guilty it's not yet true uh, clear because when they say it, it was the system but it's, it doesn't get personalized it seems that everybody and nobody at the same time are guilty so those this, those negative emotions cannot actually relieve anywhere they cannot be gone and that's why they get piled up because people cannot actually express the negative emotion and they have to live with them. They, they keep saying somebody's guilty, but there is no way out for those emotions, which is not good at all. 